All right, well, good evening, guys. Good evening. Ah, praise the Lord. It's Exodus chapter 18 and 19 this evening as we continue on our redemption story, if you will. So the Lord has been bringing His people out of Egypt, getting Egypt out of His people, working, saving, bringing them to a place of trusting Him more, bringing them to places where they thirst, where they hungered, where the enemy battled against them, and He would be intimately involved in providing their needs. He'd be intimately involved in saving them, even in the midst of delivering them out of Egypt, even in the midst of bringing them to the promised land. He would continue to work in this process of sanctifying His people, refining His people, and connecting and becoming more personal with His people. So as we uh, come to 18, the Lord's going to be kind of settling down Israel and beginning to make them live a little bit more like a nation. You know, they were scattered all across Egypt when they were slaves in various ways, different places where they would work, um, though they may very well their living area may have been in one place, they didn't function as a nation, they functioned as a ruled nation. But now they're going to begin to function a little bit more as their own people. And they're going to learn about how to live as a, a family of God, a nation, in their relationship to God, to others, and how to live. So Father, as we get into your word, may you bless it. May we pick up a little bit more, Lord, may we glean a little bit more about, about you and your relationship with us, our relationship to others, Lord, and even maybe a little bit about the maturity and the rules in our, in our own lives, how we, how we minister and represent you. Lord, be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 18, verse 1. And Jethro, the priest of Midian... Moses' father-in-law heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of, the, of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came and with his sons and with his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other about their well-being. And they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods." For in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders to Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. All right. So here we come into a time where there are 
not by the bitter waters or not in the battle, but they sit down for a meeting of praise and fellowship and testimony. They uh, went from war to peace. We don't really know why Zipporah left or why Moses sent her back, but it is interesting that in verse 5, <clears throat> when he speaks of, um, not verse 5, excuse me, um, verse 6, when his father-in-law says of your wife and her two sons, that perhaps there were, you know, as many suspect around the circumcision of Gershom and Moses being called a bloody husband, that there were some family issues going on. Perhaps that's a hint to that. But we don't really know why he was, she was sent back to, to her dad and to the homeland. Perhaps it was to not be a part of the uncertainty of delivering God's people from Egypt. Perhaps there were some serious issues at home. Don't know. We don't know. Not much sense in speculating, but speculation is always fun, so got to do a little, but so um, he's bringing her back, and it doesn't really say that he went out to greet her or her children, probably because um, hospitality was really kind of the number one rule. It's so important in this culture that to go out and honor his father-in-law who'd come and to have this time of fellowship and communion was of first priority. It's interesting that a Gentile priest, this... Uh, Jethro, this guy not of the nation of Israel, knew about the Lord. And he, he seems like maybe he's got a little bit of reservation. I've heard about this, the Lord. I've heard that, uh, you know, he exalted himself above the proud gods of Egypt. Heard about some of the things that he's done. Maybe Moses had told him a little bit about the Lord when, when he was on his 40-year shepherd's ministry out there with him. I uh, don't know, but he seems to have a little information about the Lord. And, and so, while he's been over in Midian, he's been hearing about some of the things going on in Egypt. He's been hearing about the things that the Lord has been doing, what Moses has been um, ministering, what's been going on, this great deliverance. So he's, they're going to sit down and chat about that a little bit. It's interesting, always a good thing to find out when you start to hear about things, to find out if these things be so. You know, we always go back to the Bereans. They heard Paul and they dug into the scriptures to find out if these things be so. Um, oddly enough, as I was thinking about uh, what to share and finding out about things, if they're true or not, um, on October 30th, 1938, the uh, Halloween edition, CBS put out a broadcast where uh, Orson Welles was kind of doing a redo of H.G. Wells' famous novel, War of the Worlds, <laughs> which many of you guys have heard the stories and so on, which caused, um, some say, a nationwide panic. People uh, at some point were fleeing their homes because... CBS would be cruising along and they'd interrupt it for a second and say that there's this strange thing or strange craft that had landed. And then it would go back to the regular scheduled program. And then a little while later, it interrupts again and said, you know, the military's under attack or whatever. And so people actually had thought that the Earth was under invasion from Mars. <laughs> you know, and you, could you imagine if you were watching whatever news channel you watch, and all of a sudden they interrupt it and try to spend some story. Um, and it made it believable. A lot of people would believe that it was, in fact, true. Now, some, as they've gone back to research, try to believe that the, the widespread spread national panic that CBS had caused um, wasn't as widespread or as massive as, as many sensationalize it to be. But, um, you know, the police poured into the, the station... The switchboards were lit up like a Christmas tree, people calling and trying to find out if we were really being invaded, and it was all kinds of crazy going on. And uh, so eventually some people found out <laughs> later that night when they searched out to see if these things were so, that it was not in fact so. We were not in, being, under, uh, being invaded by Martians, 
and everything was actually okay. So Jethro, he's hearing things that are beyond belief that the Lord is doing. He's hearing about this massive body of water being split in two and the water standing still like walls and, and a, an entire multiple millions of people going through on dry ground and the most powerful army on the face of the planet has been wiped out in just a moment. He's hearing about unbelievable plagues of darkness and insects and every firstborn in Egypt dying. I mean, could, this, this, could all of this stuff really be true? Is it sensation? Is it hype? Have the Martians invaded? So he comes and he's hearing all these stories and he's, and he's uh, pretty interested. And, he, and uh, he, there in verse 8, And Moses told his father-in-law all the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the hardships that had come upon them and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptian. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say, now that he, he, now he knows, blessed be the Lord. I'm oh, sorry, verse 11 he says, now I know the Lord is greater than all the gods of Egypt. <laughs> Unlike a lot of the Americans in 1938, Jethro here waits, and he waits to find out firsthand from eyewitnesses, oh, is this thing true? Did these things happen? And as Moses retold the story, shared what the Lord had done, he just, man, bless the Lord. These things are indeed true. God is the God. And so I like that. Find out if these things are true. Verse 13. <clears throat> and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit? And all the people stand before you from morning until evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a difficulty, they come to me and I judge between one and one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and His laws. So it would be kind of curious if, as we generally understand it, that the Lord was had pinned Moses down for really for not taking care of his family. There, when um, Zipporah circumcised his son and called him a bloody husband that one of the first things on the very next day that his father-in-law does comes and checks out, hey man, you're still way too busy. <laughs> you're still really caught up in this. Here we are at a point where I'm bringing your family back to you and the very next day after you spend yesterday with me, now you're out here with however many thousands of people would have had complaints. Because here we've got a couple million complainers out there, even at 1%. If only 1% came to Moses, that would be a lot of people. So he looks at him and says, hey man, what are you doing? I don't even want to get right, right to work. And you see, Moses now, he, he's just now got his house back in order, in my opinion. And now as it was time to transition, as, as the Lord was really going to bring this nation together, it was going to be time to start putting order in the Lord's house. And how often the Lord desires and or makes us go in that order where we first get our own house in order so that we can know how or be able to also, um, to put the Lord's house in order. He desires that to happen first. That Moses would have his family. That he would have his priorities straight. And then he's going to get some wisdom, some fresh set of eyes to see how to walk with this, this nation. And, you know, we kind of, we had a little bit of that here recently. Um, a gentleman was willing to come and volunteer a bunch of his time and take the security guys and a whole number of people just around the church and just kind of assess what we do, why we do, how we do it, and give some fresh opinion and eyes to just security and thinking about um, 
how he functions as a church, both for uh, internal or external threats or issues. And it's, al- it's always just good to have this fresh set of eyes. To You know, you, you just kind of get in tradition. I always use the story of cutting an end off of ham, but I won't go into that. But you, we get in these traditions of sometimes we don't always remember why we do them. We've just always done it that way. And so he was able to come in and sometimes, you know, just ask, well, why do you do it like that? Well, well, that's just the way we do it. So Moses has got that for him. Why are you doing it like this, boy? This doesn't make any sense. You're going to wear yourself out. So Moses got a fresh set of eyes on what he's beginning to go out and to do. I would assume this wouldn't be his first day out since he was right out there doing it the next day. But Verse 17, So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do, it's not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God before, for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. So in a lot of these ways, Moses gets to continue on really um, modeling, shadowing for, foreshadowing the Lord Jesus and going to the Lord for us, for the people. And so as he does that, um, he's going to get to kind of also check in if this is a good plan. Is this a good idea? See if, you know, take it before the Lord. See if it's a good idea. So Moses, you know, a lot of times we kind of get in a similar trap where God is doing something amazing, or in Moses' case, he, the Lord had done something you know, done beyond the impossible. He'd done amazing things. And his father-in-law comes and says, you know, just because the Lord does the impossible doesn't mean that you can. <laughs> um, and it's really easy sometimes when, when great things are happening or maybe the Lord's on the move in your life to, to just ride that wave maybe a little too far, step into things that maybe we shouldn't, get a little excited, get ahead of ourselves. And pretty soon we set ourselves up for just being overworked, overexhausted. Heap ourselves up with the best of intentions, with heavy burdens, until we can't do them anymore. So Jethro, he's going to give him some advice. I came across this little quote or statement, I, I liked it a lot. I don't know how well I would ever be at applying it, but I liked it a lot. You know, delegation is the exercise of leadership, not the abandoning of it. And so a lot of times, especially when the Lord's doing something great, like in Moses' case, you want to jump out there and you want to be the leader. And if you feel like you're not intimately involved or you're not the one heading it all up, that perhaps you're not in leadership. But it is the exercise of leadership, delegation is, not the abandoning of it. I like that. And so he encouraged them to check with the Lord. You know, I even think of, for myself, as something kind of practical and tangible, even just with our families. You know, as you got a family with a bunch of young kids, and you're doing it all, and somehow the Lord does a supernatural work, and you survive it. (laughs) But as your kids grow up, you learn to delegate, and they begin to take more and more and you begin to function more and you don't it's not an it's not something where you give up your authority or leadership as a mom or a dad or whatever but you learn to delegate and exercise that leadership verse verse 20 and so you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do moreover you shall select from the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times, then it will be that every 
great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that <coughs> excuse me, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, ruler of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves, and Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. <coughs> D.L. Moody once said, I'd rather put ten men to work than do the work of ten men. Moses said, ah, I like that. <laughs> so it's kind of a, more of a military term phrase that he kind of brings in here, the whole rulers of ten, thousands, hundreds, and fifties. Um, brings some order, some rank, some responsibility. I really enjoy the the men that he encourages them to select. Some interesting, good, just good counsel from this guy that we don't know to what degree he knew the Lord or of, knew of the Lord. But he tells them to select God, guys such as fear God. Do they have that walk? Do they fear God? The Lord is He the number one priority in their life? If any, that there is nothing that outweighs pleasing Lord, the Lord in their life. Men of truth, men of truth, love truth. It was interesting as we were going through a design for discipleship on Monday night that 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 was one of the qualities that the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul of someone who has been matured in the Lord, someone who matures in the Lord, is someone who speaks the truth in love. They love truth, men of truth. Hating covetousness. I would suppose in, in Israel, since this gets a little bit more into also ruling the nation, that it would have been quite easy for them to really become covetous and reward themselves. We see that in politics today very much. Those who rule the, rule the nation. I wish that was a qualification for helping to lead and rule our nation. That they would have to hate covetousness. And play such over. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 where it speaks a little bit more on these guys. It also notes that they should be wise and respected in their tribes which is almost identical to the, the qualifications that Paul gives Timothy for what an elder should be. And he doesn't speak about what they could be, but what they currently are. Whether they're in the position or not, that this is of their character, and this is what they are. And I think that, I think that really speaks to a covetousness. Because oftentimes our, money quick, our mind quickly goes to money. But coveting, especially like in the instance of the Apostle Paul, this was one that really nailed him when he got into the law and read that when the, basically when uh, the law killed him, was it, was, this was a biggie for him. Because coveting, the position or knowledge or recognition is also something that a man that the Lord wants to put into leadership shouldn't covet. Position shouldn't covet. Money, of course. But all the things that could go along with this position of prominence in this budding nation. So you're going to teach him to be a team player, Moses. But also the guys that, you, that the Lord has you select should be a team player. They should be men of the word and men of prayer.
some all good characteristics that the Lord would have. And, and what I love about when the Lord lays out the characteristics of people that He would have in leadership is that those characteristics are exemplified by people who have it or don't. That they're, that they're the same either way. I like that. So, chapter 19. This first 18 verses here, or chapter 18, probably took place after chapter 19. Some would think, and I agree, that it was, probably, that it was placed before so that they could get into the account of Mount Sinai and not stop. Um, because in chapter 18, verse 5, it says, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God, already at Sinai. And then 19.1 says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the, wild in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So it seems that anyways that that had taken place after this moment. Perhaps he didn't like it sitting right in the middle later. Ten Commandments and then Jethro. I don't know. <laughs> Liked it before. Anyways, just a little note. Have fun with it or don't. I don't know. Anyways. So promise fulfilled. Back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, the Lord had promised Moses that um, I'm going to send you there to Pharaoh and I'm going to bring you back to this mountain to worship me. Promise fulfilled. The Lord had been faithful and I think it's worth just stopping. The Lord's going to tell the nation to do this a little bit later, but it's worth stopping and remembering what a charge that was. <laughs> what a charge that was that Moses received on the mountain from the midst of that burning bush. What an impossibility. Beyond the mind or hopes or dreams of Moses, God was going to accomplish. And God had brought him through it all through it all. What a moment that must have been. So they're out here in the desert. Desert doesn't always mean dry, sandy, dusty place. It very well could have just been an uninhabited graze land. Desert is kind of interchangeable with several different places. It can be dry and sandy and dusty or it can just be an, an uninhabited place. So as they come here to this place around Sinai, where how whatever the conditions may have been like, they needed to enjoy it. They were going to be here for a little over 11 months right out here in these plains by the mountains. For, for us to put it in, maybe get the same uh, feeling that they got, they're going to be here for the next 57 chapters. <laughs> the rest of the book of Exodus, all through the book of Leviticus and the first nine chapters of Numbers. So I know most of you ladies like to tent camp. <laughs> Put that into perspective. Going to be here for a little while. <laughs> oh, now, you know, and it might even make uh, the best of us turn into Israelites. Maybe some complaining. I don't know. <laughs> John Corson pointed out that Mount Sinai was uh, thorny and that Horeb, another name for it, meant to kill or destroy. As the law pricks us, if you will, and the law ultimately shows us our sin, which brings forth death and destruction. Verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. All right, guys. I just, I just, Moses just came to this place. Promise fulfilled. Impossible done. I made a promise to you that was exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that you could ask or think. And now I've brought you out. Promise fulfilled. Now he says to the congregation, remember this. Remember what I did to the Egyptians. As he's about to give them this law, and he's going to enter into this new dispensation, this new economy, time period, 
with the nation of Israel as they're going to experience things that are even, even more intense than a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. So remember, remember Egypt. Remember what God has done in your life. And a lot of people make note, and I think it's worthy of the note of, I bore you on eagle's wings, and the, the illustration of as a baby eagle, an eaglet, chicklet, I don't know, whatever they are, as they grow and as the mom knows it's time for these guys to fly, she'll kick over the nest because they'll always nest very high and they'll go plummeting towards the earth, making, I'm sure, all sorts of crazy sounds and the, and the mom will dive and if they don't fly, she will scoop them up on her back, on her wings and bring them back up to bear them up. And that process will be repeated until they learn to fly and to live on their own. And the Lord is going to be doing that for the nation of Israel. Remember what I've done for you, bringing you out of Egypt. How I bore you up as an eagle does. You know, you're going to be in these times where you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm going down and I'm going to hit the ground. I'm going to bear you up. You were coming out here and you thought you were out of food and going to die. I need to go back to Israel. Then there was manna. You came to a place of bitter waters. And then he made them sweet. They came to a place where they had no water, thought they were going to die again, and then provides water from a rock. And I don't know how that applies to your life, but there are times when we're going to be in that, that position where the Lord is bringing you out of that that nest. For Israel, really kind of points back to chapter 16, verse 1 through 3, where they begin to say, oh man, I wish I was still back in Israel or Egypt, back by the meat pots and everything was fine and wonderful. But the Lord took and turned over the nest and said, hey, time to learn to, to go and to grow. And then he would bear them up when they'd stumble. The Lord does that for us as well. And bears us up. Tips it over, helps us to fly. So freedom, freedom's an interesting thing. Freedom, it, it needs to. I don't think it always does, but it, it must for us lead to maturity. If freedom doesn't lead to maturity, then we oftentimes find our way back to bondage. Uh-oh, somebody didn't turn their phone all the way off, that'd be me. <laughs> freedom must lead us to maturity or we will wind up in bondage we have to learn we have to learn to be able to leave the nest that place that we are comfortable in the world or maybe even that place where we're just we're fed and, and not laboring the Lord knows just the right time to bring us through that process and maturing is a process of losing one thing, oftentimes, and then at some point you gain another. You lose one comfortable spot, but you may gain freedom. You lose one place, but he brings you to another. For them, you know, they thought, yeah, I thought it was going down, but, you bore, but they were bore up. Thought they were going to die at the Red Sea but the Lord saved them. And I trust as we look back in our life for what the Lord has done for us that we have many a moments where we thought, I don't know how it's going to work out, not going to work out. And then somehow, some way, the Lord swoops in <laughs> and bears us out. Verse 5. Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So they get some instructions of some things to speak to Israel. First off, he reminds them there a few verses back, hey, remember what I did for you in Egypt? 
and then I have how I bore you up on eagles' wings. And now, therefore, obey my voice, keep my covenant, that you may be a special treasure. Now I like that. I don't know how really to put any traction to that or whatever, but I, th- I think I could just sit on that without even really any real life definition, and I could just be happy just being the special treasure of the Lord. <laughs> That's good enough for me. I don't know how the Lord's going to define that, but I'm a special treasure to Him. I like that. But Israel, above all people, for all the earth is mine. So the Lord is going to bring them into a special place, special relationship to Him, even though all of the earth is His, all of the nations are His, but He's going to put Israel in a special place. And though Israel still has a special place, it's not like the Lord has not almost spent the same amount of time, maybe more, with the nations of the earth as He has brought the gospel to us, as He spent with the nation of Israel. And so it was not that the Lord didn't love the other nations or wouldn't send the opportunity to know Him and come into fellowship with Him to the other nations, but He was going to definitely put them in a unique position in relation to Him, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. And within this nation, we know that there's going to be the Aaronic priesthood. There will be priests, but He makes them a nation of priests. And a priest really is just someone who goes to God for the people, which we have Jesus for that, but it's also a person that goes to the people for God. Has kind of both those functions. And Israel was going to be a light to the nations. They were going to be a group of people that were going to communicate not only what God had done, but also who He is. They were going to communicate Um, His holiness, the morality of what a person should be. They were going to receive the promises, the law. And so they were not only going to go, they were not only going to um, have the opportunity to represent the, the Lord and follow Him, but to be a light to the world. I think, you know, we can really also draw from that in that as our function, as the New Testament also calls us a kingdom of priests, that, now granted, we don't have that, we, you know, there's only one mediator between man and God, the, the man Christ Jesus, that he is our high priest, but we still have the opportunity to go before God for people, and I don't mean like in a Catholic church sainty way. But when you have a, a crazy cousin or a neighbor down the street or whatever, we have an opportunity to go before the Lord and, inter- and pray for them. We have an opportunity to intercede for people. That there is a number of ways that we can go to the Lord for others. And what a ministry that that is. But also that we can go out to the world for the Lord in that ministry of being a priest of God. What an awesome opportunity. A kingdom of priests. A holy nation. A holy nation. Six times in the book of Leviticus, the Lord says, be holy because I'm holy. But it doesn't stop there. First Peter, also in chapter 2, He takes that and he applies it for us. He says that the Lord says, be holy because I'm holy. And you know, we can't really represent the Lord very well. We can't be those who are ambassadors or saying, I'm growing. I want to be like Jesus and not have holiness as a part of our life. Because he is holy. It's a part of who he is, what he's like. And if we're going to grow into that, that also has to become a part of our life. To represent and not only tell who God is and what He's done, but also His holiness. To walk with Him. Verse 7. 
So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear what I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. <laughs> so he calls them all together, brings back uh, the words of the people to the Lord, and, and they're excited. We're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to go for it. All that the Lord has commanded. <laughs> we're going to do it. So, <laughs> what, a, what a thing we step into sometimes. I think we're a lot like this. But these guys here, before they really realize, maybe it's because maybe they didn't have the law yet, I don't know. I suppose there's a lot of reasons. But they didn't really know themselves and their own sinfulness very well at this point. We're going to keep the law. We're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to go for it. Having kind of a Apostle Peter moment. <laughs> Lord, I go <laughs> all the way with you, Lord. We're there. I would, you know, I'd never fail you. We're all in. But shortly thereafter, there would be broken tablets and golden calves and horrible parties and years later, stoned prophets and rejection of the Lord. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Well, I guess they needed to do it, but always good to uh, remember, remember to uh, seek the Lord for some grace. But these guys here, they get some, they get really excited. They get really excited, and they're all on board. Heard one one pastor talk a little bit about. Why the thick clouds and the darkness? Why couldn't they see the Lord? And there's a whole number of reasons, but I, it really kind of sank in a little bit more as I thought about the golden calf. That here it would be just a short bit, a little over a month or so, and they wanted to make an image to worship. And perhaps if the Lord would have allowed them to see him, perhaps that. He would have been the image, that, or whatever they would have saw would have been the image that they made. They went with the golden calf, which didn't work out too well. But that's interesting because, you know, the Lord doesn't really, you know, no one has seen God at any time. And really, the, we have almost no descriptions of what Jesus looks like. You know, we know that, you know, he had no form of comeliness. You know that he wasn't, you know, the, he wasn't the Saul of his day, if you will. Um, but for the most part, we have no real records or images or statues or portraits or lengthy descriptions in the Bible of, of what he really looked like. And I think that's, that's just the wisdom of the Lord because we are, well, we're just foolish. And man is so prone to idolatry. So the Lord kind of saves them from themselves at least a little bit on that. Verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, nor shall, <clears throat> but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Clothe yourself. So he's going to put some attention to the clothes. He's going to say, okay, consecrate, sanctify, set apart, get your hearts right. And not only just get your heart right, but 
I want to see, you know, we want to make sure there's some outward expression of that. And I think anytime there's re, it's real, there's a real heart action going on, oftentimes you see an outward expression. Whether it's someone scoring a touchdown and people make an outward expression, or you're just surrendering all to the Lord and you lift your hands to Him. It's been a good day and you smile. There needs to be, along with this, some outward expression. But he's going to give them some specific things to do. First, I want you to wash your clothes. Change your clothes. The changing of a garment. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, he speaks of being clothed with love. Psalm 132, verse 16 talks about being clothed with salvation. Psalm 30, verse 11, he says to take off that sackcloth and be clothed with joy. Revelation 7, 14 speaks of having our garments washed. 1 Peter 5, 5, be clothed with humility. So there's a principle he's going to begin to work into them this outward expression, this thing, I want you to start working on your heart, guys. That there should be a change in your attitude, in your heart, in your mind. You're going you're gonna to be hearing the voice of the Lord. You're going to have an experience of a deeper relationship with God. That should affect you on the inside, which will be noticeable on the outside. My favorite change of clothes, I can't resist, 2 Corinthians 5.2. 2 Corinthians 5.2. I'll start in 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we, for we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. A lot of clothes changing, or shirts putting on, or humilities, or loves, or things throughout the scriptures, but I like that one. I'm ready for that change of clothes, further clothed. But these guys, they're instructed before, they, before the Lord descends to change their clothes, wash them up. He also says that you're going to keep a distance. There's going to be a distance between you and the mountain. Understand that there is a gap between you and the Lord. But it also, also really lends itself to... Um, to the importance of the messenger. He pointed out just a few verses back that he was going to make Moses stand out, that they would understand that he was the guy, that they were to listen to his words. There in verse 9 it says, And I will speak with you so that they may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So this this distance and what was about to go on when he was going to go speak to the Lord himself this way. And Moses got to speak to the Lord like, like nobody else. Um, we're going to see that later on down the road when he rebuked some people who thought they could be up there with Moses. And he said, don't you realize I talk to this guy like one friend talks to another. <laughs> you guys aren't in the same, aren't in the same category. So the Lord really separates out his messenger and and I, for me, that just really reminds me of that unbridgeable distance between us and the Lord that really highlights the importance of one who can go before the Lord for us, the one who can bridge the gap, Moses in many places being a picture of Jesus. Here it highlights the importance of this messenger. <clears throat> so when the Lord comes down, he also points out something, it's kind of strange, because as he, he begins to speak about, um, don't come near 
your wives. Speaks into the marriage relationship. And, and as he's talking about um, an intimate relationship between a husband and wife, and nowhere in Scripture is that really stated as, as a sinful thing. But why, do, why do that? Um, honestly, I really, I don't know if I could really tell you. Other than I think the Lord maybe wants to, to get them to start thinking about marriage. This marriage relationship. Hey, be thinking about this relationship. Maybe, maybe not, but I liked it because as the Lord is about to descend and the trumpet's about to blow, I want you to think about marriage relationship. I think for us that has a little deeper meaning than the Israelites, but I like that, um, especially since I didn't have really any other explanation. But. Verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunder, thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, so Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. I like that on the third day. You know, here we got Moses. He's a picture of the Lord. It's going to happen after the third day. Thinking about marriage. Thinking about the changing of clothes. And bridging this gap between us and the Lord that we might be with Him. We might hear Him. To me, it was just something that... It just blessed me as I began to think about, again, the, that changing of clothes or being further clothed and being with the Lord. Thinking about being with Him. Thinking about the trumpet sound. Thinking about the Lord descending. It just blessed me. And I hope that the Lord speaks through it and, and blesses you as well. Would have been something else to be standing by that mountain. I don't know if you guys in any of your travels have ever got to do anything like those, well, they try to make them 5D, 7D, whatever, experiences, rides that you can do at different theme parks or whatever. You can do it down in San Francisco. We do one sometimes at Great America when we get to go. And uh, they'll be rocking you back and forth and moving you all over the place and you're flying around in your wannabe spaceship and it's blowing wind on you and it's got the smell of dirt coming up and this ant jumps out and it squirts water in your face because he's spitting on you or something. <laughs> and we pay to do it, of course. you know. <laughs> but imagine the sights and the sounds of the God of heaven descending upon this mountain and the top of it melting like a furnace and every green thing or whatever's there is burning and on fire and the wind's blowing and the, just the sensation, the ground vibrating, everything moving. What an awesome, awesome thing to behold. I would have to say I would probably be, there would be a little fear and trembling going in me as well. The trumpet growing louder and louder. And there, there goes Moses, you know, he can, he can do it. Go ahead, Moses, I'll be back here. Verse 20. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through, to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, then come up, and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. The Lord is awesome, inspires awe. He is holy. 
He is a consuming fire. They, as well as we, are a privileged people to go into His presence. We are a privileged people to hear His voice. We are a special treasure, a royal priesthood. And He has made us kings and priests unto our God. And we are privileged most of all for what Jesus Christ has done for us. So in a different way, as we wait for the descending of the Lord and the sound of the trumpet and to be with Him, we have a, that time with Him. May the Lord really bless you. And may He teach you what it is to be with Him and to follow Him. Speaking of the millennium, and the mountain, just remember when I was reading about this holy mountain, this verse came to mind. And it's in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Speaking on into the millennium, when we are ruling and reigning with Christ, after the descending and the trumpets. It says this, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a day that'll be. We wait for that day. When the Lord descends. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And that you are an awesome, you are an awe-inspiring God. And as we have read and we've learned about what you did for them in Egypt, as an absolutely true piece of history, as this happened and a people stood around and watched you descend and really just give a, a, just a fraction, if it's even measurable, a glimpse of how awesome you are. So Lord, whether, as we take communion tonight, as we continue on with our week, may you be an awesome God in our heart, set apart. Lord, may we learn and grow to be holy as you are holy. We're so thankful that you have borne each one of us up on eagle's wings. When we were falling, Lord, you saved us. You rescued us. And so we just were so thankful for Jesus Christ. And Lord, as people are all around celebrating, Lord, a, just an atrocious holiday this evening, Lord, may you, may you make your name reverenced this evening, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.